And thank you all very much for, for coming. Uh, so Kathy's, Kathy's book, uh, The Last Act of Love, is a, a bestseller about the time when she was a teenager. Her younger brother, Matty, was knocked over by a car. He lived on in a persistent vegetative state for eight years until a, a judge agreed his feeding tube should be withdrawn so that he could die. She's now followed it with a manual for heartache, how to feel better. It's a survival guide, and it reminds us all that we're not alone. Louisa's done many jobs, um, including a dispatch motorcycle rider, um, which I'm particularly fascinated by. Um, her, uh, her book, You Left Early, A True Story of Love and Alcohol, is an account of her relationship with the acclaimed composer Robert Lockhart and of his alcoholism and finally of his death. It seems so cursory to sum up the powerful subject matter of, of your books in, in one sentence like that. So I thought actually the, the best way to do it would be to begin with you telling your own stories in your own words. And Cathy, I wondered if, if you'd start us off by, by, by setting up the context and perhaps reading a bit from your book. Um, yes, of course. It's, a, it's very nice to be here um, on this Sunday morning. Um, one of the things I think about a lot with this is that I always feel... Well, by writing my book, I learnt that everybody has a thing. Everybody's got something. I'm just someone who wrote a book about it, um, thought about it a lot. So I like it. I always want to know what everybody else's journey is, what's brought people to this tent on this morning. Um, but yes, shall I read a bit from the beginning and then... Which one? Uh, um, I'll, <laughs> I'll the, give you both. I'll have the first bit of the first one. So I'll just read <clears> from the beginning. Can you move your um, head piece up just a little bit there. I think that, yeah. that will do it. That's slightly better. How's that? No? Shall we? Thank you for working out <laughs> before I start reading. <laughs> <laughs> Halfway through a very difficult sentence and everyone's like, we can't hear. <laughs> Shall I try again? Is that better? Yeah? So I try reading. Um, I might stand up a bit, because it's... It, <laughs> <laughs> Has that made it work? <laughs> <laughs> right, let's go for it. Ah, there's something going on there. So I sit down there. The fir tree. The chapel. <laughs> The chapel is not how I remember it. All these years, I've imagined a simple wooden room buried deep in the hospital. Instead, light shines through a splendid stained glass window onto an altar with an embroidered cloth and large brass candlesticks. It feels like a church. I ask the chaplain if everything looks the same as it would have done when I was here over 20 years ago. We've had a new carpet, she tells me, and pink covers for the seats. Those soot blows down from the roof, so I'm always out here with a little hoover. There's a smallish tree to one side of the room, with a blue and white cuddly elephant cropped against the base, and bits of coloured paper clipped among its leaves. That's newer, the chaplain says, a prayer tree. That won't have been here when you were. I walk over to it and take one of the leaves between my thumb and forefinger. Plastic, but convincing from a distance. I read the messages written on the bits of paper. This must make it easier for atheists, I think. Far easier, as an atheist in extremist, to write something down and attach it to a tree than to kneel in front of an altar and try to work out how to make a deity you don't believe in listen to what you have to say. Some of the messages are addressed to God, some to the living, some to the dead. There is a range of handwriting styles, differing levels of ease with grammar and spelling. It's the badly punctuated ones that I find most poignant. I imagine they demanded the most effort. Some are in a spindly, elderly hand, others in childish, rounded letters. I hope the baby is all right when you have it. Fifteen years and I miss you like yesterday. Dear God, thank you for listening. Please pray for my little brother. Love you loads, little buddy. For my dearest, greatly missed daughter, she died 25th of the 10th, 83. I have never got over it. Pray for us all. 
I pause lost in these hints and echoes of other people's stories, other people's love, and then wonder what I would have written if this tree had been in place when I stumbled in here on my way from intensive care to the relative's overnight room. I know what I wanted then, but how would I have found the words? To whom would I, to whom would I have addressed my plea? Please don't let my brother die. Dear God, please don't let my brother die. Please pray for my brother, I don't want him to die. Don't die, Matty, please don't die. And the years collapse and I see myself kneeling and crying and begging with my hands clasped together in prayer, talking to some unknown and unbelieved in force. Please don't let him die, please don't let him die. I'll do anything, only please don't let him die. And what strikes me now, as it never has before, is that I can't say my prayers went unanswered. I was given what I asked for. My brother did not die. But I did not know then that I was praying for the wrong thing. I did not know then that there is a world between the certainties of life and death, that it is not simply a case of one or the other, and that there are many and various fates worse than death. And that is what separates the me standing here now by the prayer tree from the girl kneeling in front of the altar all those years ago. She thought she was living the worst night of her life, but I know now that far worse was to come. The thing she feared was that her brother would die, but I know now that it would have been better for everyone if he had. It would have been better for everyone if, as she knelt here, begging for his life, his heart had ceased to beat. If the LED spikes on the monitors had turned into a flat line. I'm nearly finished. <laughs> If death had been pronounced, accepted, dealt with, it would have been so much better if Matty had died then. She was praying for the wrong thing. I was praying for the wrong thing. It's such an incredible piece of work. How hard is it for you to, to, to go back and read that now, many years later? Um, well, I have a, an ongoing relationship with the story of what happened and then my own attempts to tell that story, escape from that story, go back into that story. Um, so, I mean, I'm able to do it now. I, could, I remember the first time I read that publicly and there was a, you know, there was a lot more happening in my body. I thought I was going to be sick before... I, my, I mean, th it's interesting, isn't it? Thinking of reading it the first time, I have slight symptoms of arousal, slightly started to shake. Not remembering what happened to my brother, remembering the first time that I read about it. Um, and then, I'm still not sure of this, and I think this is different for different people, but for me, there is something helpful in continually reminding myself that I'm not alone in this feeling of being stuck in my story. And really, for me, the best thing about writing my book was that then other people wrote to me. So I've come to see it, actually, as the opener, the opener of a conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Louisa, for you, the, the events that you, or, or at least the, the book that you write about the events that happened is much, much more recent. And I just wonder how possible it is to, exp to separate the lived experience from the word on the page for you. Well, that, that's the whole thing, isn't it? How, how are we doing here? With, ooh, okay, I'll hold it here. Um, that's the whole thing. You have a, 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 an experience which is long and complex and inexplicable and, and terrible. And oh, I'll, I'll borrow this one. <laughs> what about this one? Actually, yeah, this is easier. Um, and you have that whole experience, and then you've got the great pile of having had that experience and all those memories, and that's a mess. And then you do, if you're Kathy or me, you do your job. I mean, I think a great many people would write about terrible things that happen to them, and diaries and, and therapy, you know, writing is wonderful for that. And people will say to me, is it cathartic? And I say, no, it, it, it's not cathartic at all. It's my job. It's, it's, what, it, you know, it's what, what we do. And... You know, clearly, if an experience like this is going to happen to a writer, then the writer is going to write about it. It would be absurd 
to expect anything else. Uh, I haven't read in public what I'm going to read. <laughs> so here you go. You, you, you get the first. I've, I've read it on the audio book. That was an experience. Um, can I borrow your copy? You may. It's signed by the author, though, so give it oh, back wow. to me. I'll, I'll be respectful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wrong glasses. Oh, no. Sorry. Do you need your glasses? Hold that for yeah. a moment. I think, actually, this mic might be working. You might be all right just with that. So. Am I all right with this? Am I all right with this? If I fall... Oh. OK, right. Glasses. No, where are you? There we go. Oh, no, they've fallen out. Oh, I have no glasses. Right, I'll borrow yours. I, I lent my glasses to Armistead Morpin one time when he was having the glasses reading issue. I was very proud. <coughs> okay. Do I need it? Do I need... No, okay. <laughs> okay, we're there. Um, this is the introduction. This book is a memoir by me, Louisa Young, a novelist, about Robert Lockhart, a pianist, composer, and alcoholic, with whom I was half in love most of my adult life, and totally in love the rest of it. It's as much about me as about him, and is of necessity a difficult book to write. So why am I writing it? Why expose so openly chambers which are only usually displayed via the mirrors and windows with which novelists protect their privacy? Because his life is a story worth telling. Because our love story, while idiosyncratic, is universal. Because alcoholism has such good taste in victims that the world is half, the world is full of people half or totally in love with alcoholics. Charismatic, infuriating, adorable, repellent, self-sabotaging, impossible alcoholics. And this is hard, lonely, baffling, and not talked about enough. Because although there are a million and a half alcoholics in Britain, many people don't really know what alcoholism is. Because alcoholics also love. Because I don't want to write a novel so about an alcoholic and a woman. I want to write specifically about that alcoholic, Robert, and this woman, me. Just by little because everything I've ever written has been indirectly about Robert, so I and the time has come for me to address him directly. Because the last time I tried to address it directly, I told him, and he said, you won't be able to finish this until I'm dead. Because I've realized that for me, quite the opposite. He won't be properly dead until I've finished it. Thank you. And, and you go on to, to finish that chapter talking about how it's a story that you hope is sensitively told, and it absolutely is. The, the book is about you, about Robert, as you say, but as you point out, it's also about the disease that's alcoholism. And it's a disease that people just don't recognize enough. And you have a very, I hesitate to use the word message, but, but that comes through, doesn't it? I hope so. I mean, I hope it doesn't come through as something sort of didactic. Um, but of course it is, because I, all the way th through when I, I was dealing with Robert's situation and my situation as a result of it, I was feeling totally at sea. And I've made the sort of slightly flippant comment that the only decent book I've read about being in love with an alcoholic is, is The Tenant of Wildfell Hall, which is you know, a little bit out of date, but the <laughs> principles and theories and emotions behind it are utterly recognisable. And so, yeah, in a way, I'm, I'm doing that thing of writing the novel, writing the book that I wished had existed at the time. And if anybody comes to me, and indeed they have, at the moment that you bring up the topic, the stories start to tumble out. Um, you know, as you said, it's the opening of a conversation. There are certain things that most of us, many of us, and certainly in Britain, find terribly hard to deal with, terribly hard to bring up. It's never the right moment. We never want to betray somebody else's secrets. We don't want to make them look undignified. Maybe we're wrong. Maybe, you know, we don't know what to do. We're, we're, we're unsure and we're ignorant and, and we're embarrassed and we're shy. And I thought, well, clearly I've got to write this book. There's no point writing it if I'm not as honest as I can possibly manage to be. 
I really don't want to hurt anyone's feelings, but actually also sod that a bit. Oh dear, but maybe that's the wrong thing to do. So it, it, it becomes a process, but you have, or at least I had in the back of my mind and the front of my mind, to be honest, all the time. I wanted to talk about it openly. I want people to read it and I want them to go, I'm not alone. Mm. And I want them then to get down to Al-Anon or to tell their brother or to, you know, whatever it might be, to start talking about it. Your book has been similarly honest, and you also document your struggle with alcohol. Does what Louisa write about that resonate with you? Well, very much. Um, so, so this is, yeah, so um, I haven't talked about this, but I haven't, I've not drunk alcohol for a year now, which I feel brilliant about, and, I, um, and, it, and it has been hard, but I must say I'm enjoying sober life. I loved Louise's book, and I think, I hope that if I hadn't already stopped drinking, the book would actually have helped me to stop drinking. Um, I think it, I think it possibly, I think it possibly would have done. I did, I found it very, you know, I have my own issues with alcohol, and I come from a long line of people who have destroyed their lives through alcohol, much more flamboyantly and dramatically than I have. Most of my problems were mainly visible to me. Um, I'm not convinced it's my core issue. I think the depression is my core issue and drinking large amounts of alcohol makes me more depressed and less able to manage my depression and I can't drink small amounts of alcohol because it makes me want to drink large amounts of alcohol so I've had to not drink at all. So, um, but I think it, but it, it, but it, I mean I feel very nervous now talking about it because again it's not a, it's not a subject that is discussed. And what I found in my own case is um, that because I don't hit people when drunk, because I tend not to fall down the stairs, or at least not publicly, because I have a, there's always been a big motivator, I want to fit in really, so I don't like making a fool of myself out in front of people anymore, so I don't do it publicly. But because of that, therefore, it's almost more transgressive to remove myself as, a, as the social drinker that everybody perceives me to be. So that's just, it, it, it's not really discussed. And I think there's a whole idea that it's a society where at one end there are people who don't have houses. You know, there's the drunk guy in the street who's shouting at people with a bottle, with, you know, with some cans of special brew. And then at the other end, there's all us wonderful social drinkers. Wine o'clock, Prosecco o'clock, Pims. No problem with drinking sherry at 10 o'clock in the morning because it's Christmas. And that there's nothing in the middle. Whereas I think there are vast amounts of people who are a bit more... That I think it's a continuum. And I think there's a vast amount of people more who are on that continuum. And it's a big, complex area, which, again, Louisa explains so well. I think there's all sorts of different things at, at play with it. But I think anything that shines a light is good. And I know a lot of people who I know are quite miserable but they think it's their fault. So for ages, I thought it was my fault I couldn't moderate. I spent three, basically my first book came out, I went completely mad and drank myself into a breakdown. Then I thought, right, I've got to do something about this excessive drinking. I'm gonna learn to have a moderate relationship with alcohol. And I tried to do that for three years before realizing it was impossible and that actually that wasn't my fault that it's impossible and I can be better without it, which I am. Mm. I mean, you go into this uh, the whole Prosecco o'clock thing mm. in, in some detail in your book, and also the fact that it is a, a, a depressant. I mean, th there's a difference, isn't there, between circumstantial depression and, and, and chemically-induced depression, and, of course, uh, alcohol depression. Yeah, the problem with alcohol, the problem with the whole the drugs don't work thing is, you know, it does work. It's great. What could be nicer while it's being nice? And then for most of us, we notice when it's not nice and we go, oh dear, that wasn't very nice and we don't do it again. And for those who don't have that ability, they carry on and on and on searching for it to be nice again, trying to get the thrill of the first drink with the 98th drink and the f thrill of the first summer of Pim's O'Clock on your 49th summer after Pim's O'Clock really stopped working for you at all. And 
you know, if alcohol wasn't a good anti-anxiety drug, a good social drug, which makes everybody, I mean, I sometimes wonder if the English would ever get married or have children at all <laughs> if we didn't have <laughs> or speak to alcohol each other. or have a conversation. And, you know, and we are an alcoholic society. You know, it used to be obligatory in the Navy. You'd be fed your tot of rum at 11 in the morning. We've been, we've been drunk and in denial about it for about 3,000 <laughs> years, as far as I can tell. And yeah, it is funny, and it's also true. And most of the time, people get into a habit of drinking because their parents are in a habit of drinking. And if you're lucky, you never have, ever have to think about it. And because it's so normal for so many of us, it's really hard to understand why it is deadly, a deadly mental and physical disease for the people who are made slightly different to those of us who are made, you know, the, the easier way. Mm. Uh, you, um, uh, when, when an alcoholic dies, that, that provokes a, a, a certain set of responses. And, and you both mm. address in your books the hierarchy of heartbreak. <laughs> Maybe you mm. could tell us more about that, Cathy. Well, I came to see that with my... I mean, this started really young. So my brother, my brother was in hospital in the head injury ward after intensive care. And we realised that the nurses were being less nice to people who were in intensive care because it was their own fault. So there was a boy there who'd... I, I, he, it was some, he'd been trying to nick stuff from his own school or do petty vandalism and he'd fallen through the roof. And we could see that the ladies weren't looking after him as well as they were looking after my clever brother who'd been knocked over by someone else. Of course, I wanted the nurses to look after my brother, but I actually didn't want them to mistreat the person who'd done something silly. But, you know, he'd done something silly. Have we all not done something silly? And I think when something terrible happens in that moment of... I mean, I've done lots of terrible things in my life where if, if like, that moment had gone wrong, that would now be what I could be known for, you know. And on the continuum of human behaviour, I'm not that bad as a person. So we all have these things. But it sort of slightly gets frozen in time. And there are things, I think, and there's different hierarchies. There's sort of a moral hierarchy. And then there's a it's difficult to understand hierarchy. There's a shame hierarchy. I mean, I think sometimes the people that suffer most are those to whom horrible things are happening. But they're very, it's still very difficult to, to talk about. I mean, I talk about my brother and it distresses me. But... I'm sure if other different things had happened to me when I was younger, when I was less robust, would, I mean, if I'd grown up not loved, would I be, I'd, I'd eventually, I think that's the thing. I think if you, if you are loved as a child, I've come to see that you're so much better at coping with pretty much anything that happens mm. to you. So there are all this, there's all this network of hierarchy in the way that people perceive it. And I think as well with the notion of, uh, trauma. So people talk about big T trauma, which would be things we all understand. Like, so I think we grasp that if you are a soldier and you have to kill people and watch your friends die, I think we understand that that, may, that then might cause you problems in the future. Is that because we understand that, don't we? But sometimes people are really affected in their lives by something that kind of on paper doesn't seem to be that big a deal, but I think it's a big deal for them. You, you, you shouldn't be like marked out of ten on what's happened to you. And I'm sure, um, I, I'm sure that other people could have experienced what happened to my brother and not be affected by it in the same way that I have been. Which doesn't mean that they're, well, they're probably more robust, or they might, you know, there's all sorts of things that might be going on there. But it, again, if we could get away a little bit from, the, of not. If we could be, in general, if we could just be kinder to ourselves and to each other and sort of accept, that's what I'm trying to get to in this book, it kind of doesn't matter what's happened to you. If, you. if it matters to you, then it matters. And that's the most important thing. Sometimes people will say to me, um, oh, my mother died last year. I'm a bit worried I don't care about it enough. <laughs> and I'm like, well, if, if, if you don't, then you don't, do you? If, if, if There's not a crime in being more upset about being made redundant than being more upset about your mother dying. It's because of the values you attach to work. It's because of the way that the various things played out. But I think it is ve it's very difficult to walk our own path in society. The, the, all the stuff coming in about how you should, how you should feel and how you should behave. Um, but I thought there's a wonderful bit in Louisa's book wonderful as in very acute when you write about how it's kind of easier to look after someone with cancer than to look after someone who's an alcoholic because mm. society accepts that more 
Um, yeah, there was an odd, interesting, and perhaps sort of incomprehensible thing that Robert said, which was that he would rather have cancer again and have the surgery, which removed half his jaw and his tongue and his ability to eat or talk, and the chemo and the radiotherapy. He would rather go through all that again than drink again. Because when you have cancer, you know what the enemy is and everybody has the same enemy. But when you're an addict, you, you are the enemy. And the complexity of that, it's so much harder to deal with. Mm. You, uh, you talk about then having to tell people uh, <laughs> a, a, about uh, that, that, that your, your, your brother or your lover has died or that he is about to, that he's in this situation. And you both go into the, the, the etiquette of it, really. Mm. You tell us what you shouldn't say and also what you should say. How do you tell people? And how do you... My, my mother recently died. We tried to navigate through this, this euphem euphemism-free death. It was almost impossible to get away from had a good innings, gone to a better place, new star in heaven. But, I mean, you're both very, very good on that. How do you do it? Well, it's tricky, isn't it? And, I mean, these days, I actually just feel more kindness, love and understanding is called for. So I can look back now at things that made me really angry at the time. But actually, the person was very well-meaning. Um, mm. I do, in general, I would say, my piece of advice is don't, don't try and talk about a belief system unless the, pers the bereaved person you're speaking to is in that belief system. You might be well-meaning, but I would keep God out of it. it. I found it very difficult to be told that the terrible thing that happened to my brother was part of God's greater plan. Um, I've also always found it very difficult to be told that this is in some way psychologically beneficial for me in the long run. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. You are a better and wiser person because of this. Maybe eventually that might be a little bit true, but it's not what you, it's not what you need. But I've come to see that actually it is very difficult. And the main thing to do is to not be a road crosser. So I've come to see that anybody that says anything is better than the people that hoof off in the other direction because they mm. don't want to see your pain. Though there are always those people who actually wish they had hoofed off because they said something <laughs> so bloody awful. <laughs> there was a man at a bus stop, and I know he meant well, and I did my very best to concentrate on his motives rather than what was coming out of his mouth. But he did say, oh, I hear your partner popped off. Still, it was expected. To which my reply was, was it? Who by? Because <laughs> not by me or anyone who actually knew him. Anyway, um, yeah, no, but the, if, it don't, if it doesn't kill you, it'll only make you strong. I actually use that as a lyric in one of my songs, and I will quote the lyrics now, which are, if it don't kill you, it'll only make you strong. That's what all the people say, but God, they're wrong. <laughs> it makes you mad, it makes you sad, it makes you gone. I don't know what to do. There's a verse from a song. No, it's, it's um, yeah, the, the, uh, hold off on the cliches. Yeah. And then we'll try and hold on to the fact that everybody's doing their best and feeling, you know, embarrassed mm. again. Mm. Both books are about hope in some way, but also the, the loss of hope. And I, and I wonder if that's something that uh, was a moment or a gradual process for you, Louisa. I mean, you, you got to the point where he, he had stopped drinking and then, and then suddenly he's ill. Well, you know, life's a bugger, isn't it? And this is a man who had a drinking problem most of his adult life, who, for whom it, you know, it took you know, all that stuff which is charmingly loose when you're 25 and then at 35 it starts to get a bit stinky and at 45 it's like, seriously. Um, he and I got together as a couple when he decided that he really did want to stop and he was committed to stopping and getting treatment, which was, you know, great, a wonderful moment. And so I said, yes, okay, in that case, let's do it. And it took him five years of trying and lapsing and trying and into rehab and out of rehab and physical damage and mental damage. Um, and finally, he did. After five years of that, he sobered up. And he was in quite a poor physical condition because of all this stuff. But he was sober, and he was unbelievably grateful for being given this second chance to 
you know, have a life and to rebuild his friendships and his relationships and to survive and be there for his kid. And that was wonderful. And then two and a half years into that, he wasn't very well. And turns out that he had a stage four cancer. And then he survived the cancer. And when he died anyway, um, there was no alcohol in his blood and no cancer in his body, but he still managed to die of it. Anyway, Kathy once gave me an incredibly good piece of advice, which was... Um, she, was, she was saying that one of the reasons for writing these books is so that we wouldn't ever have to tell the story again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and here we are. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, but for you, I mean, hope, hope, I think, it seemed to me, was something that, that ebbed away. Yes, I mean, I think the... the and actually, it was a, it's been the challenge of my life as well as the challenge of my book, which for me are very, is very interlinked. I can't really separate what happened now from the, my attempts to make sense of it, including writing about it and then including talking about it. Um, but I think the, the difficulty was to explain what happened between the, you know, being in the chapel, praying, please don't let, you know, praying, that thing that so many people tell me they've done, the atheist and extremist who, who just decides, you know, I have nothing else, I might as well try a prayer. So the, from the girl in the chapel, what, what she then learned o over the course of the eight years. And then also after that, that even after my brother was... I really thought that when my brother was dead, I would have liberated him and therefore liberated myself, which turned out not to be true. So... I see, I'm surprised now that I find that so upsetting, because surely I said that before and I was OK. But one of the things I think... There is hope. There's a wonderful um, grief psychotherapist called Julia Samuel, who's written a book called Grief Works, which is very good. She talks about grief is a tug of war between the pain of loss and the instinct to survive. <laughs> now that, if I, somebody could have told me that when I was 17, if I could have understood that process a bit earlier, I think it, it might have been less brutal. So I, I slightly think my purpose in writing these books and talking about it is... You can't live someone's experience for them. Um, life, life is about learning what it feels like to be human. It's not a shop or a spa from which we can or just order what we fancy. You can't live someone's experience for them. But I think I find out things that make it feel less brutal for me and that, that make me feel, actually, if I'd known this in the past, if I'd understood that a bit, for, for me, understanding brings comfort. And hope, I think, is often in other people and the presence of other people mm -hmm. but I think I slightly feel one of my functions with grief is to say it's a long game you know and in loads of ways I feel a bit silly you know all these years ago I get embarrassed when people sometimes people ask me how long ago was it and I'm still embarrassed at kind of having to admit that I'm still bothered by it because again society, society has kind of told me I should have been over it, but, you know, you've had your two weeks off. <laughs> You'll be okay by now. So in some ways, I feel like the longest griever. But then, also, I don't. Because every time I admit to feeling this, people email me afterwards, which possibly will be some of you, and say, I just wanted to tell you that when I was seven, my sister was drowned in the river by my house and it has affected my whole life and now I'm 72 and every time I play with my grandchild I remember my only memory of my sister before she died. <laughs> so every time I share this stuff, it makes me, me we talked about this earlier on because I'm half Irish, I still feel that it's the Irish side that's written these books and my English side is profoundly embarrassed <laughs> So part of me is thinking, what are you doing you insane bitch. You've admitted the alcohol thing. You've talked about the depression. No one ever will ask you to do your job again because they're scared you won't turn up because you're so mental. <laughs> oh, why are you here? And then sooner on, and I'll get that panic later on, but then people will talk back to me and I'll think it's good that I said this stuff because that's what other people needed to hear. Mm. And it's what I needed mm. to hear. I, I need to hear it again. It's not enough. I haven't written it and it's over, it's still organic for me. I mean, I think it continues to, it just continues to be mm. so. Mm. I don't know whether, if there will come a time when I don't feel moved and or interested in it, then I wouldn't do it anymore. But that time has not come. Mm. You, both of you have mentioned other people in your story. I wonder how easy it is to write about a story that, that isn't just about you and Robert. There are a lot of other people involved too. Yes. Can I just say something about what Cathy just said, though? Um, apropos the length of grief and so forth. Um, 
my mother's mother drowned in 1939, looking to my sister there. And um, I think that my sister and I and everyone in our family can agree that that has shaped and formed our family and how we are how we were as children, how we are as mothers to our children, which is presumably, you know, and when they say in the Bible that the sins of the fathers are visited unto the seventh generation, if you make that instead the sufferings of the mothers, or indeed the fathers, if it's the sufferings, well, it just, it doesn't go away because it makes us, it becomes part of us and it forms who we are. And it's getting used to that and taking it on board that allows us to, you know, to live in a new territory that, you know, there, there's no going back in it and it never actually leaves you, does it? Um, yeah, no, the thing of other people. Um, yeah, I mean, sitting here today, I'm looking at the audience and there are a few familiar faces and one or two that I feel some responsibility towards in that department. Yes, because, you know, we know that we're not the only person who loved somebody and we're not the only person who lost them. We're not the only person that they loved. And because of being writers, it's as if we somehow take hold of it and say, yeah, yeah, this is ours. We know everything and we're in charge of you know, we're, we're, we're the archivist, we're the, you know, the, the high priestess of the, of the memory, whatever it might be. And it's important to acknowledge that in some ways, obviously, that can't not happen, but that it's not what you're designing, it's not what you're planning, it's not your, your purpose. I mean, Robert is not somebody I would ever have written a book about just as him. He's not somebody who would have, like, oh, you know, the incredibly famous composer must have a biography. It's because of what happened to him and what happened between us. And that is such a common and universal experience. So while trying to be, yeah, trying to be both delicate and responsible regarding other people, trying not to be too possessive, but at the same time, the whole point of it is to state your truth about the thing, about the illness and the way that the illness reaches out and touches so many people. You know, some illnesses are just too big for one body to carry them. And actually quite a few. I mean, the, the older I get, the more I think that more illnesses have that quality. Addiction, certainly. Cancer, I don't know how people manage to get through cancer when they also have to go to work and make a living and, you know, them or their partners, their family. Depression, certainly. Everybody has to have a reaction to it. And in that reaction, they get pulled in. I mean, I've heard it suggested as well that even writing a book about Robert and addiction is another manifestation of my obsession with him and with the illness itself. I'm, I'm still, if you like, obsessing about addiction in the way that one's not ideally meant to, but that everybody does, and the, those of us who come up against it have to work out what to do about. Mm, mm. In terms of, the, I mean, I suppose this is the crux of it. How do you then take all of that and put it on the page? I mean, memory, obviously, and you both point out in your book that, that memory can be unreliable, but you, you both also make use of, of documents and things like that, of, of court records or of, of Robert's diaries, his, his therapy uh, notes that, that were taken. But to actually sit down, Cathy, and, and start putting it on the page. Yeah, I mean, it's really hard. There were times as well when it felt like... I, I felt like I was self-harming. You know, I felt like I was sitting down and bleeding into my computer and that it wasn't maybe very good for me. But actually, I also felt it was. I, I had this underlying instinct. And actually, a lot of... I'm not sure I would have written about it had I not had my son. I felt and still feel very motivated to... And I'm very interested in the moment in the concept of ancestral trauma and how what's happened in the past, mm. like, as you said, mm. about what happened to your mother, that the way that reflects and revisits itself on future generations. And I felt that I didn't want to... It, it wasn't that I had in any way forgotten or not cared about what had happened to my brother. It's that I put lots of effort into trying not to think about it. But I realised that, that I didn't actually think that was going to be good for my son to be in that state. So writing was the way in which I tried to sort of liberate myself from it. Um, but in terms of where I, the way I actually kind of did it in a way was I'd get very lost in what I wanted to say and then I would just take myself back. I would imagine a time before computers, a time before paper, a time before pens, and I, would, and I still do this with writing. I come back to living in a small tribe, sitting around a fire with people at the end of the day, 
just trying to say to someone what your experience that day was like. This is just, I just want to tell you what this was like for me. And I hope that in telling you what this was like for me, and by doing that honestly, you might possibly, I think I probably hope you might understand me a bit more, but also I hope that then if it happens to you, it might be useful to you. And that then if you, that is, I think, nothing, I mean, what kills you does, what doesn't kill you doesn't make you stronger, but actually there is a way in which you can craft the mangled wreckage around you into something that has a kind of purpose mm. that is, that functions in a, cons a, a potentially consoling way. I looked catharsis up actually, because people kept saying to me, is it cathartic? And I realized in that way, when you think you know what a word means, but you're not 100% sure. So I went and looked it up and it means to purge through excessive emotion. And I thought, well, mm. maybe. But then also, subsequent meaning is literally to shit. It means to <laughs> shit. And I thought, I quite liked that. So in some ways, I feel I've like crapped all over the page or vomited all over the page. But then there's a crafting process. It's not just brain vomit. <laughs> <laughs> you then, you, you craft it and you make it into something. But I think there is, when I teach life writing now, which I really love to do, I talk about the regurgitation phase and then the crafting phase. Um, and that's a helpful way for me to think about it. Louisa, how, how do you do it? Yeah, I mean, you, you have a wonderful phrase in the book. You, you talk about um, beware phrases that consolidate the possible to the probable to manufactured memory. Yeah, it's really hard. I mean, this started because I knew perfectly well when Robert first kissed me, it was on a balcony in Primrose Hill in 1983. And I remember the party that I was at and I remember the conversations that we'd had. And then I was up in Primrose Hill with the friend whose party it had been and I said oh look there it's, you know, where you used to live blah 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 she said I never lived there <laughs> that, that party you had you know in 1983 and Robert came and there wasn't a piano and you remember and she said no I lived like three streets away didn't look out over the hill there's no balcony <laughs> and I went whoa okay and this seemed like a fairly good lesson in not necessarily believing the fictions that we all create to make sense out of things. And then later, while looking through all the piles of paper, because I knew Robert for such a very long time, and I kept diaries on and off, and I'd actually been writing about him, as I found out when I looked at my old diaries, in you know, sort of notebooks that I'd completely forgotten. And there was an account of our first night together. And it was completely, I mean, different in very fundamental ways to what I'd remembered. And the irony of that is that later when um, Robert developed this condition called Wernicke Korsakoff syndrome. Hands up if you've heard of it. Who's heard of Wernicke Korsakoff syndrome? I'm sorry for your trouble. <laughs> it's, um, it's a very horrible condition that you get if you treat vodka as a, a balanced diet. It's vitamin B deficiency basically taken to extremes and it affects your brain function. The, um, the structure of your, the blood vessels in your brain starts to collapse and so you bleed into your own brain. And one of the things that, makes, that, that happens as a result of this is, um, oh, the word's gone right out of my head, confabulation. Your brain carries on trying to do its job. So it will snatch at bits of knowledge and bits of memory and will sort of put them together in whatever order it can find, you know, just sort of. And so when I would go and visit Robert in hospital in um, Charing Cross Hospital in Hammersmith, he thought it was incredibly nice of me to have come all the way to Australia to visit him because he was there uh, taking part in a backgammon tournament. And um, his father, who was a French taxi driver, was bringing Debussy in every morning. And Robert had done really well and he'd beaten George Best, but then Spike Milligan had accused him of cheating in the final. And it's, you know, it's hysterical, it's really funny, and it's made up of all sorts of things which are sort of half true and also not true at all, but they're all, you know, Robert's obsessions. I could imagine that actually playing backgammon with Debussy would have been Robert's idea of absolute heaven. So I was glad he was having a good time in his psycho world. But then you realize, you know, we all do this all the time. We put things together because we can't quite exist if everything is in a state of chaos all the time. It doesn't make sense. So we work our ways through things, we find our passages, we find our paths, we acknowledge other people's paths. It's nice when we go alongside, sometimes we diverge or we collide and, you know, that is difficult. I've had one or two collisions about the book with people who see things in a completely different way. And yeah, then you have to sort of hold your hands up and think, 
Okay, that's your truth. I can't write your truth. I can write as near as I can manage to my truth. But yeah, when it's all down on paper, then it looks like it is the truth. And, you know, that's one of the, uh, that's one of the dichotomies of the situation. Mm. And of course, you're surrounded by things he left behind. I mean, not, not mm. only his notes, but, but also his music. I mean, th mm. those, those are, must be big triggers for you. Do they still affect you? Well, I think on that, anybody who's got a dead person who is still living with them, one way or another, you know, even if it's not a sort of overt thing, you know, initially, you know, you talk to them in the shower and they're, they're, they're right there. But they, you've spent a long time with them and they become part of you and you've worked out a relationship with their absence. It kind of settles in, it still ebbs and flows. Um, I mean, some people are more sensitive to being set off. Yeah, a piece of music can absolutely, you know, the, the various times I've had to pull the car in. Um, but Robert's own music, Actually, when I listen to that now, it's just an absolute joy. It's an absolute joy and a comfort. And mm. I, it helps me to delight in the fact that he ever existed. And yes, the sorrow that he wasn't just a little bit different and could have had a life which had flowered for longer and in a healthier way. Yeah, that's, that's a shame. You write about triggers too and also about reclaiming. What do you mean by, by that? Uh, well... So, I mean, I have a new theory about memoir writing, actually, not Louisa, incidentally, but quite often... So I realise now, quite a lot of my first book, the reason I can describe things so vividly was that I was effectively having flashbacks, like you have with post-traumatic stress disorder. So my working theory was memoir, is that lots of memoirists have undiagnosed post-traumatic stress disorder that they don't understand, and what they're doing is they're writing down their flashbacks. If you want to start... Write, reading memoir in that way, I think it would be interesting for you. I think there's a thesis to be written on this as well, so I gift it to whoever fancies it. Um, but I can see it now, because one of the good things that happened to me because of writing my book was I went so mad that I then had to go back and have therapy, and this time I had really good therapy with a therapist who really knew what they were doing, so I don't have undiagnosed post-traumatic stress disorder anymore, which is nice. I still have other issues, <laughs> but I don't have that anymore. So... But in terms of reclaiming, what I realised is that I'd attached... I don't quite know the right way to explain this, but I'd attached meaning to all sorts of things. Like, so, for example, the rain. I always got depressed when it was raining. Or, or rain seemed to be a central factor in being depressed. And what I real, when I understood a bit more about how the mind works, is that then whenever I saw the rain... The rain would make me, basically the rain would trigger a slideshow in my own head of all the other times I'd been depressed in the rain. And as I would play this to myself, I would become increasingly desperate and more depressed because I was just remembering, basically like it's the opposite of a highlights reel. It's a shitstorm reel. And that was what I continually did to myself. And I had different ones. I had, I mean, a lot of them were dominated by my brother. But also it was like all the shitty sex I'd had. You know, I had a sex real which was not nice <laughs> i had a being depressed in the rain real and i used to play these to myself all the time and as i began to understand that i just realized i can press pause so that when it rains now i don't have to play the real i can think oh that's interesting i can think the rain is trying to trigger me to remember other times of rain but instead i could actually replace that with something else so i think i write in this book about actively finding myself some new rain-related memories. And now, I quite like the rain. I, mean, I would go out in the rain, I'll lift my face up to the rain, I'll enjoy the sensory effect of the rain on my face. <laughs> or I won't. I'll just be a bit pissed off because I'm going to get damp and a bit smelly. I'm a normal person with the rain. Mm -hmm. So I've managed to reclaim the rain. There's also... I've tr I'm trying to make progress with reclaiming Christmas. Um, <laughs> I loathe hate and I'm disgusted by Christmas for loads of reasons, including the fact that in, up until very recently I was always drunk slash hungover, which didn't help. Um, the awfulness of the first Christmas after the terrible thing has happened and the, the way that you're cross-hatching your own basic like inability to work out how you're going to survive until tomorrow with all this enforced jollity. Uh, the fact that actually now I feel quite aware of other people's distress and despair, all heightened by the enforced jollity. So I make a bit of progress with reclaiming Christmas. It's still quite hard, actually. But that's what I do. I set out to 
look around the situation of what I find difficult about something and then de detangle it from all the crap. Hmm. A lot, a lot of very scatological, Kathy. <laughs> a lot of, a lot of crap going on. Um, having f for both of you, uh, in a moment, it's going to be your turn. I'm going to uh, invite you to to ask them a couple of questions. But just before we get to that point, having having been so close, having observed death happening over a while, I wonder how you feel about your own mortality, Louisa. Well, I didn't really observe death happening in Robert's case. I've seen it in other cases. Um, but every every death is is a memento mori, isn't it? Because it seems to me we, we we die in degrees, and you know when people are old, you see old age taking their capacities, physical or mental, from them bit by bit, one at a time, often in a very inconvenient order. And I look at my darling parents, and I think, please give me my mother's mental health and my father's physical health. If I get the other way around, then that's fine, I just won't be here for any length of time at all. Um, but, you know, in ourselves, we see things slipping away. You know, I went to the circus the other day and watched young people bouncing around, being fantastic, performing. Their bendy backs, oh my God, a bendy back, the <laughs> joy. You know, no longer for me. I have other things, you know. What is it we have? Oh, no, well, you're young anyway. Um, you know, wis wisdom of age, <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, I basically gratitude for still being here quite a large urge to appreciate as much as i can and enjoy as much as i can while here i've got a healthy i think attitude towards it in that it's um you know this compost heap i don't mind going in a hole in the ground and you know ilty more bartat the sheep can come and graze, or the ducks can eat the worms, you know, all that stuff. That's fine. I'm at home with being, you know, a different set of atoms. They're just operating in a different way. Because they say nothing ever goes away, does it? It just reconstitutes itself in different forms. So that's fine. Kathy? Yeah, I think I agree with all of that, really. And I think that, um, cause for a long time, I didn't really want to be alive. And I just felt life was something I was enduring because I didn't think it would be fair to my parents if I wasn't here. And then I got better. Again, I did feel better. And then with that feeling better, I suddenly become very frightened about my own safety. So I'd never been frightened about my own safety. I used to slightly fantasize that I would die in some preferably quite heroic way. <laughs> So I was never, and the, the upshot of that was I just wasn't frightened. So if I was on a turbulent plane or in a dark alleyway, I mean, I just didn't give a toss, you know. And actually, when I look back, I think it protected me in some situations because I think possibly I re radiated some sort of don't fuck with me signal that maybe in some odd way kept me safe. I don't know about that. But the, pros the thing for me of getting a bit better was I went through a period of then feeling very frightened about myself and my own safety. So I became scared of dark alleyways. Um, very scared of, um, very nervous of being in a car. Um, so I've kind of got over that now. And I don't, I feel very chilled out about my own death. Because I'm not, because I'm not really scared about what happens to me. I'm scared that something terrible will happen to someone that I love and I will have to witness it and be found wanting. So that's what I, that's what I'm frightened of. I think I now feel, I feel I've got a duty to do to my son. And I just hope I get to do that for a bit. You know, I get, I, that, that would be what would... I think, and of course we can't know, I think that if I found out that I was going to die, I would just be focused on how I could best prepare. So I think I tend to think about death like often older people do, because I've been excessively preoccupied with it and witness of it in my youth, I think. Thank you. Are there any, um, are there any questions from, from the audience? I am very surprised, but yes. Oh, hang on a second, because uh, Ben has a microphone for you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's the lady with the glasses there, the pink glasses. Um, do you think grief ever ends? That's a really brilliant question. Could I ask Louisa to answer it and to talk about the river? Can you talk yes, about the river? Yes, I can talk I about the river. this is such a helpful thing in this book. Uh, okay, the thing about the river is, if so, yeah, nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. Um, what happened to me, an image that describes it well, is you're trundling along, you're living your life, 
it's been an average life, something really catastrophically terrible happens and you are thrown into it and it is a rushing, rushing river and you are thrown about and you hit your head on rocks and you come up to the surface and you get to take a breath and then you're underwater again and eels are twining around your legs and you don't know what's going on and it's dreadful. And then after a while of this, it slows down a bit and so you only hit your head maybe twice a day instead of twice an hour. And then you realize that you're actually breathing and the water's calmed a bit and then you realize it is a river and then you, someone is holding a hand out to you. And you are become capable of taking that hand and you get pulled out and you're on the other side. And on the other side, all those people who have also been thrown into the river and made it across and they wrap you in a towel and they say intelligent, kind and loving things to you. And you realize that basically you just live in a different territory of human experience now. And that your job is to accept that and every now and again you need to go back into the river to haul other people out or to put your arm out to them. And that's the silver lining, is that you can, probably, on a good day, maybe, be of some use to somebody else who's in the, in the, the, the chaos of it, and you can help get them out. And a great many people help get me out. And if the book, and I know that Kathy feels the same way about it, because he said so even today, if when you see somebody in profound grief, you can help them, or if your book can help somebody that you never even meet, then that is a blessing. There was one more question over here. I think we've just got time uh, for one from Suzanne. Thanks, Ben. Uh, here, this lady in black here, Suzanne. I'm just wondering about during the writing process about how you're affected by the weight of responsibility to your kind of anonymous reader because you're both writing deeply personal stories that are memoirs, but memoirs to which people will, re have, will relate and perhaps treat as self-help books. And does, do you worry about that, or does it affect what you write or how you write? Um, I did worry about that, possibly too much. I do over-assume responsibility for everything ever and tend to think that everything is my fault. Um, but I uh, am responsible about it. I got people to... Not so much with the first... I've, I love it when people feel helped by my first book, which they did, but that's still quite a surprise to me. It was just a book about myself. I didn't expect it to be helpful for other people, and it's surprising that it is. Beautiful that it is. Then, of course, my second book was it's supposed to be a bit helpful, so I got various people to read it. A very good, clever friend of mine who is a doctor read it for me and told me that it was okay. <laughs> And I got a couple of therapists to read it. So I had various people reading it because I didn't, again, I didn't want there to be any, um, I didn't want it to do anybody any harm. Again, you can't, there's a limit to what books can do. There's a limit to what we as individuals can do. Sometimes people are just not in the right place. People don't want to be helped. There were lots of years when I didn't want to be helped. There were a lot, I get aggravated now that I feel I kind of didn't really know until last year that extremely heavy drinking isn't good for depression. But of course I knew that. I just didn't want to hear it. So if in any of those times, if somebody had come up to me and said, you know, I think the drinking isn't helping with the depression, like, would I have listened? And one of the things that I asked my therapist to read it, because I was frightened. I was frightened that people would be angry with me because of this book. And then I was frightened that I wouldn't be able to cope with that. Um, and she said, what you've got to think is, if anybody is angry with you about this book, it's not about you, it's about them, and it's where they are. And there's nothing you can do about that. Hmm. And that's what I tried to, that's what I tried to think now. But this is a big, I mean, this is a big deal for me. I've had to stop all social media because it just makes me feel very nervous. I'm scared that people will say something horrible to me. It makes me anxious. Um, even little bits of journalism, my agonies about sending it out because I worry that people will respond negatively. So I don't really know what that's about. But yes, I did feel a level of responsibility about that. Did you want to add um, to that? Or? No, I think that covers it. Yeah. You know, we, we do our best and it's tricky and probably we get it wrong. Sometimes in this modern world of so much communication, we will know that we've got it wrong. I don't know. I haven't had very much response um, from general readers so far. It's only been out a couple of days. It's only been days, out yeah. a couple of days. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a tricky one. It's a tricky one. Louisa, before we go, would you just tell us about your album? Yeah, thank you. Um, one of the curious results, results? What, you know, a, a curious thing that happened after Robert died was that um, 
With him being a musician, he sort of occupied all the music in the house. He, that was his thing. But I've always written songs, and after he died, I wrote loads more, and they're all about him. And I couldn't really do anything with them because I'm not a musician. And then an opportunity arose through somebody, funnily enough, called Alexander Mackenzie, like this tent. I took a photo for him. Um, where he, he sort of said, oh, well, you know, does it go like this? You know, playing the guitar, where I couldn't. I just had notes and, mel and melodies and lyrics. And so one thing led to another one. I've actually made an album. And I'm possibly the oldest lady ever to release a solo album in this country. Um, there's a 67-year-old in Canada called The Grind Mother, <laughs> who's great. She does death metal. Well, my album is not like that. It's a lot, it's a lot of sort of late-night songs with, you know, I'm not the greatest singer, but the lyrics are good. And the music is... Um... Anyway, it was really interesting as late... Hello. Late-onset creativity. I recommend it. <laughs> uh, and Cathy, finally, what's, what's next for you? Um, well, actually, I'd quite... can I share with you one of the things that helped me to stop drinking? I realised that one of the... I mean, there were probably about 50,000 reasons why I liked drinking. I really like loved drinking. Um, I realised that one of the things I loved about drinking was I loved that moment after three or four drinks when everybody starts being themselves a bit. I, li I liked the big talk that happens when everybody's a bit drunk. And I realised that I wasn't going to be able to live without that. So the way to stop drinking was to not wait for the permission of alcohol to have the big talk. <laughs> and basically what we've done this morning, just being here with you and with you and with all of you, it has satisfied that desire in me to be honest as a human being, to be honest about my own flawed experience. And these days I no longer need several martinis in a posh place to be able to feel that sense of exhilaration, which I have a tiny bit now, in a sober way that I will remember. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you both so much.